Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. The number one need that we have is to know God. And the number two need that we have is to know who we are in Christ. Once you really begin to know who you are in Christ, everything begins to change. And I'm going to be talking to you about that quite a bit this weekend. Because I think that's a, that's a desperate need that we have. Until I began to know who I was in Christ, and what that really simply means is until I began to believe what the Bible said about me, rather than the way I felt or how I thought or what other people said to me, See, if you just believe what other people say to you about you, it may not always be good. Matter of fact, I can pretty much promise you that it won't be. You can't just believe what you think about you, and you can't just believe how you feel. You have to realize that all of that is stuff in our soul that Satan uses to try and keep us from going forward. The Word of God is the only thing that divides soul and spirit. It's the only thing that brings that division. So I don't care what I think, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then I'm wrong. And I don't care what I feel, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then what I feel is wrong. And we have to make a decision that we're going to see what God says about us. That's what we're talking about right now. He's got a lot to say about a lot of things, but right now we're talking about what does He say about us. And God says that you have gifts and talents and abilities. And that you're capable. And that anything he asks you to do, that you can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That you're strong in the Lord and not weak. That you're forgiven. And on and on and on and on and on. But it has to be more than somebody just preaching that to you. You have to meditate on that and study that and read it until you believe it. And when you can differentiate between who you are in the flesh and who you are in Christ, things start to get really, 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 really good. If I see myself in myself, then I can't do anything but be afraid. Because in myself, by myself, without Christ, I have got bushel loads full of problems. <laughs> John 15 says plainly, apart from me, you can do nothing. You better hope and pray that you don't just get me tonight. <laughs> That's why I said earlier, if you came to see what I could do for you, we are all in trouble. <laughs> but if I see myself in Christ, and if I trust Him that when I step out here, no matter how I feel, I don't always feel anointed. I don't always feel like it's going to be great and wonderful and good and everybody's going to be happy. Sometimes I don't feel any of that. But I can tell you this, that as long as I keep my faith in God, I have yet, after 35 years of preaching, I have never once failed to come out here and open my mouth and not have God fill it. Now, sometimes it's a little better than other times, but it's always doable. Amen? Amen. But you see, really, fear will try to keep you from taking that first step. Fear will fill your mind with so many negative things about what's going to happen. If you dare try to do that. That's sad to say, the larger percentage of people never fulfills their destiny. Which means they're never really fulfilled and feel complete inside. Because they live in fear. And I think a lot of times that we have a lot of subtle fears in our life. Things that have been there for so long that we don't even really, really realize that they're there. You can't see yourself in yourself. You have to learn to see yourself in Christ. You don't go around saying, oh, I'm just a mess. I'm just a big mess. I never do anything right. No, you say, I'm redeemed and justified. God's living in me and he's working in me. I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. Now, let me give you just a little short mini lesson about this being in Christ thing and kind of what this means. 
1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. Now, we need to meditate on that for about a week or two, I think. As he is right now, so are we right now here in this world. Well, how many of you believe that Jesus is not afraid tonight? So if he's not afraid, I don't have to be afraid because I'm in him. How many of you believe he's strong tonight? So if he's strong tonight and you're in him, then you're strong tonight. Let the weak say, I am strong. Amen? You got to get all this I can't talk out of your life. I can't. I can't. It's just too hard. I can't. I don't think I can do that. I can't. Listen, anything that God tells you to do, you can do it. Oh, this is just too much for me. No, it's not. If it was too much for you, God wouldn't be allowing it in your life. He never allows more to come on you than what you can bear. But with every temptation, he also provides the way out. So we just need to say, I can do whatever I need to do in life. I want people to take a whole week and just meditate on that. I can do whatever I need to do in life through Christ. I can do whatever I need to do through Christ. It's amazing the difference in the way you'll think if you'll just take the time to renew your mind. Ephesians 1, 19 through 22 tells us a little bit about where he is and how he is right now. So you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe, as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So... We know that Christ has now been resurrected from the dead, full power, full authority, and that he is now seated in heavenly places. And look what it says. He's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that's named, above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and the world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. Well, we can say, yes. But Ephesians 2, 6 says that we are seated in him in heavenly places. So guess what? My feet are here on this platform, but I'm also somewhere else. You're sitting there in a chair. But if you're in Christ, then you're also somewhere else. Spiritually, we have been raised above this mess that's here in the world. That's why Paul said, I've got to know you and the power of your resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. So we have to understand that even as he is, so are we. In this world, what we have to learn how to do is to identify with Christ as our substitute in all things. Not just read the Bible and think that's nice for him, but realize if he's got power, we've got power. If he's got strength, we've got strength. If he's got peace, we can have peace. If he's got joy, we can have joy. And I know, you know, it's like our mind goes, but I don't feel like that. <laughs> it's almost like I can just... I can hear you thinking that because that's the same thing that, that I would go, well, I, I don't feel like that. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't feel that way. <laughs> but see, here's what happens. Now, now watch me. Listen to this. Your feelings will eventually catch up with your decisions. But if you're going to wait to feel everything, you're never going to have anything that Jesus died for you to have. You've got to take it by faith. I bet you that this room tonight is full of people that you let other people walk all over you. <laughs> take advantage of you. Disrespect you. Yeah. Yeah, they're out there going. <laughs> you somehow know that the devil's got you into some kind of warped thinking that, well, you're just trying to keep the peace. <laughs> no, really, the truth of the matter is, is you're probably afraid to confront the situation. Now, come on, don't stone me. I'm... And the longer you let it go, the harder it is to confront. And then if you ever do confront it, whoever it is you confront is going to go totally wild because you've let them get by with it for so long.
And then what? So we think, well, if I confront them, then I'm afraid they'll get angry. I'm afraid they won't want to have a relationship with me anymore. I'm afraid I'll be by myself. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. So fear ends up running your life. God wants you to respect yourself. He wants you to value yourself. And yes, we want to keep the peace, and we don't have to argue about everything that, that comes down wherever we're at. We can wait on God to take care of us. But when God tells you you need to confront something, then you need to confront it. Good, we got three happy people over here on the front row. Well, this must be for somebody here because this certainly wasn't part of what I was going to say. All right, let me use a personal example. I was a nightmare to get along with. I came from a background where I'd been abused, and so all I knew how to do was try to stay in control because I thought that was the way that I could keep from being hurt. Plus, I have a pretty aggressive personality to start with, so that with some dysfunction, a lot of dysfunction in my background, didn't leave for a very nice woman. And my husband is a real peace lover, very easy to get along with. So for a lot of years, he just kind of let me, you know, he'd go on and be happy and just let me act bad and didn't really say too much to me. And uh, I believe that there was a purpose in that. I believe that, that God gave him extra patience with me because God knew the hurt that I had in my life. And that's why I'm saying you need to confront when God tells you to. So sometimes God calls us to suffer for somebody else. He calls us sometimes to maybe put up with some things for a while while we're praying and waiting on God. But then there's also a time to confront. And so after a good few years, I don't remember how long, God really showed David it was time for him to confront me. Well, I mean, I was like a wild animal. I mean, and, and what I said was nothing compared to the way I felt. Now, I mean, and he explained it to me. He said, now, I'm just going to tell you something. He said, God has dealt with me that I can no longer let you get by with talking to me the way you do and acting the way you do. You're not going to get everything your way. And uh, so things are going to change around here. And uh, they did. <laughs> and I mean, the rage inside of me, I, I don't even know how to tell you the rage that I felt inside of me. But by then, I was in love with Jesus enough and I knew enough to know that he was right. I knew that my behavior was wrong. But if he would have never confronted me, even though I knew it was wrong, I don't know that I would have ever changed. So sometimes you're not doing somebody else a favor if you don't confront them. And you don't, you don't have to do it belligerently. Dave was not mean about it. He didn't come and say, all right, that's it. Now I'm taking over. He didn't act like that. He just simply said, God has shown me that it's time for me to confront you, and I know that you were hurt when you were a child, and I know that you've had a hard time with submission to authority, and I know all that, and, uh, but I also know that I can't let you keep doing this. And it was, it, was, it was the right thing for him to do for me. Even though I didn't like it and I got mad and we had two or three more years of turmoil, in a different way. But let me, let me just take this a little step further because I didn't intend to get into this anyway, but since I'm in, I might as well go all the way in. <laughs> if there's anybody here tonight or anybody watching my television and you're thinking, oh my gosh, God, you are talking to me, whoo. Then here, here, I wanna give you a piece of advice. If, you, if you're gonna say to somebody, whether it's a child or a friend, I mean, it could be a parent. I mean, it could, be a, it could be a parent who's got you on a guilt trip after all I've done for you. And so now, you know, they're pretty much controlling your life and you know it's not right. And you know it's time for you to stand up for yourself and say, you know, hey, mom, hey, dad, I love you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to take care of you, but you're not going to run my life. <laughs> well, <laughs> here's the thing. Or, or you know, you, you say to your children, you know, I love you. I'm going to be a good parent, but my whole life is not going to revolve around you because someday you're going to be gone off doing your own thing and then there's going to be me. 
And so I got to start building some kind of a life. Can I give you a piece of advice? You don't have to be at the bottom of your list of who you do something for all the time. And that doesn't mean that you're being selfish. I hate selfishness and I hate self-centeredness and I preach against it all the time. But it's not even wise to not take care of yourself. It's not even wise to totally ignore your own needs all the time. And furthermore, if you let people walk all over you, they're not even going to respect you. But here's the thing that I want to say. You have to realize that if you begin to change something in a relationship with somebody, you've got to give them a little time to act up. Because even if they know you're right, it's still going to be hard on their flesh. And here's what you need to do. No matter what they do, you must stay happy. <laughs> because one of the best things that Dave did for me was he would do what I knew was right and I would react badly to it, but he would not let me make him unhappy. And see, here's the thing. If you know that you're doing the right thing, you really believe before God you're doing the right thing, you're doing it in the right way, there's no reason for you to be unhappy. So anyway, I'll leave you with that thought. People have all kinds of fears in their life, little fears, big fears that have been around for a long time. Some of them you're aware of and you just put up with them because they've been around for so long. Others, maybe you put up with them so long you don't even realize that that's what it is. So why don't we just ask God to start revealing all of our fears does anybody want to do that? Don't ask him to if you don't want him to. Because we don't want to live in fear. We don't want Satan stealing from us. We don't want him tormenting us or aggravating us. We only get one trip through this life. And we need to make it count. And we need to get the most out of it that we can. And we need to leave the greatest deposit here that we can possibly leave. Don't just live for yourself, leave a legacy. And you're not going to leave a legacy if you don't know who you are in Christ and make your mind up that you're going to do all that you can do and be all that you can be for the glory of God. Amen. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know, I, I think that part about a sound mind, I think maybe we could get something out of that that we haven't really gotten out of that before. You know, I think that having a sound mind means that we can look at things accurately and reasonably. We don't have to just let a fearful thought come into our mind and then watch our emotions go wild, but we can look at things accurately and reasonably. And we can say, well, okay, I have a problem, but I also have God, and God is greater than my problem. I actually think you can talk yourself into calming down if you really want to. I had cancer about 22 years ago and uh, had breast cancer and had to have surgery and thankfully didn't have to have any kind of treatments because they caught it when it was just a real small tumor. But it was a very fast growing type of cancer and you know anytime that somebody has cancer there's always that you know, thought out there that it could come back at some time. And so I've spent 20 some odd years standing against that every time it tries to come into my, into my mind. But when you go to the doctor and you get checkups, they always want to know on the paper, have you ever had cancer? So then if you have, then they're doubly watching for stuff. And so this past year I had some, I hurt my back. And because of all the years of walking on these platforms and jumping up and down and doing other stuff in improper shoes, I ended up with some back problems. And so now I have to really take care of my back and, and wear proper shoes and sit down occasionally. That doesn't hurt me either. And, and work out and take good care of it. So, but last year I hurt it pretty bad. I mean, like really bad. And so for about four or five months, it was really bad. So in the process of that, they sent me for an MRI on my back just to see what was going on. 
and they found some lesions on my spine that they just said looks like a metastasized cancer. So, you know the thoughts. Here they come. Well, I've been around the block a few times, and so I was able to talk to myself. And uh, Dave is really great and stuff like this. He's always positive. And, you know, you can talk yourself into stuff, and you can talk yourself out of stuff. Do you know that? Come on, you're talking to yourself anyway. You might as well say something that's going to help you. So, now, I mean, I don't know what you'll think of this, but this was just kind of what I came up with. I thought, well, okay. I'm certainly not going to believe that I've got cancer on my spine. But the bottom line is, is whatever it is, even if it's that, we'll deal with it. God will be with us, and we'll deal with it, and we'll do whatever we have to do. And, you know, really and honestly, for the Christian, we all know the worst case scenario is, well, what if I don't make it? But the Apostle Paul, I think, knew how to confront that fear, the fear of death, because he said to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'd rather go on and be with the Lord anyway. I'm only staying here for you. So he had a pretty, you know, good attitude about it. Now, you know, I don't, I don't mean that. I mean, if you're watching my television or you're here and you've had a bad report from the doctor, I am not in any way trying to be, trying to be flippant about how you might feel or the fears that might be attacking you. But I am genuinely trying to help you by saying that you can have a sound mind. You don't have to have a spirit of fear, but you can have a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind, and you can just look at it with a little more soundness in your mind, not let the emotion of the fear take you over. Well, so then they wanted me to go have, uh, let's see, what was first? I had, the, I had the MRI, then they wanted me to have a bone scan. So... They did a bone scan of every bone in my body. And of course, you know, you get the test and you got to wait, 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 wait for it to come back. So I got that test back and they said, we have looked at every bone in your body and you do not have any, you have no cancer in your bones. So I'm like, yes. And so I was excited and then they said, but <laughs> there is definitely something that we're seeing on your spine. And so because you did have cancer, we feel like that we need to now do a PET scan. So then I had to get an appointment for that, and then I had to wait for that, and then I had to get that test and wait for those results to come back. And then they said, well, you don't have any cancer. We've checked you from head to toe. At, so listen, I said, so what are the, thi what are the things you're seeing on my, on my spine? And this is what they said. They said, well, it could have been some metastasized cancer from years ago that healed. <laughs> or, or they said, it could just be a birth defect. Or we don't know what it is, but we know it's not cancer. <laughs> so here's the thing. I could have, over that couple of month period of time, I could have made myself an absolute 100% total wreck. I could have had my whole family scared. I could have had all the people that enjoy my teaching scared. I could have made myself miserable. And the bottom line is, is none of that would have changed it. <laughs> so I needed to just stay strong and say, God, I believe that you're going to take care of me. And I don't want it to turn out that way. But even if it does, I am not going to be afraid of the problem because you will be with me whether I'm on the mountaintop or whether I'm in the valley. And that's the place that God wants to get us to. Well, knowing God and knowing who we are in Him will help us confront and overcome the fears in our lives. And I really want to encourage you to do that. Don't just receive fear and spend all your life being afraid, but confront it in the name of Jesus. But I know that I know that I know 
that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, it's really great to have the ability to feed children all around the world. And I have a goal and a desire to keep feeding more and more all the time. This after-school feeding program serves an average of 90 to 100,000 hot meals per One year. One meal for these kids is, is survival. Well, I'm here in Thailand at one of our children's homes. You can feed, house, and educate a child. Hope Cambodia has been absolutely amazing. We've opened 15 different orphanages. And we're so grateful to be able to build this well here in Sri Lanka. We love to get clean drinking water to people. Well, so the water they're drinking is not making their children sick, and it's, it's not dirty, contaminated water. Yeah. Definitely feel in Haiti just the absolute desperation. I'm at the Cure Hospital in Malawi, Africa. A huge line of people who are waiting to see our nurses and our doctors. Many doctors and medical people have volunteered their time. We are in Summers Point, New Jersey. Well, today we're, we're in Joplin, Missouri. We're here in Haiti in the village, and we're about to move people into brand new houses we've built. The winds were so constant with these big, big gusts. It was terrifying. 150 or more were killed. Thousands left homeless. Hey, you there, guys. Oh. Those gifts from Joyce Five Ministries. Here in Zimbabwe, I was able to hand out the two millionth bag in a prison. That you can't have a different life today. Don't know how many, you know, lives you guys save by coming in and showing the love that you guys show. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is, this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change, you can get healing, you can survive. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. De muziekleraar van Beethoven noemde hem een hopeloze componist. Een krant ontsloeg Walt Disney met het argument dat het hem zou ontbreken aan creativiteit. Albert Einstein werd door zijn leraar als geestelijk achtergebleven bestempeld. Well, you know, you have greatness on the inside of you, too. And no matter how many challenges you have in life, I'm here to tell you, don't you ever give up. The New York Times bestseller schrijfster Joyce Meyer zal je inspireren om ondanks moeilijke levensomstandigheden sterk te blijven. Bestel nu het boek Geef Nooit Op via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen 
op joy-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.